You're listening to Arsenal Pass, a flesh and blood podcast for players by players. And all about strategy, leveling up, and the latest news in the world of Wraith. Welcome to Arsenal Pass. Welcome back, everyone, to episode 25 of Arsenal Pass. I'm Brendan Patrick, joined always by calling champion Hayden Dale. Hayden, how are you doing? I'm good, thanks, Brendan. How are you? I'm good, good. So today we'll be dis- discussing how all the heroes of Wraith look to be stacking up the new classic constructed meta with the release of Tales of Aria. If you're looking for some ideas on where to, st- where to start brewing, such as what hero to pick up and start working on this early point of the season, then we've got you covered. We'll be focusing on what heroes look to dominate with the release of Tales and the banning of Chain, <laughs> which heroes look to you know maybe be having a bit of a tougher time, and of course, where all the new heroes of Tales of Aria will likely land. I do say banning of Chain. Um, <laughs> obviously, the character is not banned, but in Hayden and I's opinion, there will be a drastic reduction, and we—I um, do not think that the meta of Tales of Aria will be warped by chain, at least not in the early days. Anyway, Hayden, let's talk about your week in Flesh and Blood. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah, I'm excited to actually talk about chain and we get into the main topic of the pod. But um, in terms of what's been happening this week, playing a bit of sealed, which is nice. Uh, you know, had all my cases arrive of Tales of Aria, so you know, rather than just crack them all and get straight into it, definitely. Took a bunch of pictures of my uh, of my boxes so that I could rebuild seal pools and draft packs and things like that, um, which is a bit you know time intensive, but uh, good to do so we can go back and, and have um, packs for any sort of I guess seal pools we want to go through and things like that. So I've been building some seal pools up, talking through those. Um, did a draft, uh, you know, an, I guess a, a TTS draft, so not quite the same as a, an in person draft. But that was good to get a draft first draft under my belt. Um, and then just, yeah, just starting to brew with Classic Constructed and the new heroes. Played a few few games you know, week before last and then really jumped into it this uh, this past week. So it's been um, it's been good. How about you, Brendan? Yeah, so I got to play a few drafts as well. Um, what I was most interested by is they were very, very different. I did take uh, different strategies throughout the draft. So I played a, a draft with some... You know, some more experienced players, and I tried to you know, kind of do a funky strategy. I uh, went early into a class, actually, um, and just kind of stuck there. And it eventually worked out. It was weird. In pack three, um, I got all of the talent cards that I needed, um, which is likely due to a phenomenon kind of with people staying open heavily in pack one, pack two. And then pack three, they kind of uh, devote to their classes and pick those class cards more. So a weird strategy. We'll have to explore and see if that's actually a thing. Then in my second one, it was also another kind of anomaly. Um, this was a bit, you know, with some newer players, but I was drafting, you know, lightning um, pretty heavily in the beginning, had very, very good lightning cards, then considered going into ranger after that. Um, person on my right was in ranger, so I did get that signal pretty easily, but the two people to his right were actually in uh, briar. Um, I did end up in briar, but what happened, what was weird in that draft is that um, even though I barely got any briar cards, I actually got like the best earth cards and lightning cards, like, in the set by far like it was unbelievable how powerful my talent cards were Where like i didn't even really need rune blade cards um i had like seven or so in the end um and my deck was incredibly powerful so it's just like this weird thing where i think in like pack two pack three people started you know very much prioritizing their class cards and then kept passing me like some of the best you know ice um lightning and earth cards in the game so um yeah that one worked out too so lot lot to lot to kind of you know look over and um, discover i think yeah. in this format that's really interesting i think we're gonna definitely jump into some more tales once we have a bit more info under our belts as well um i definitely found that the draft format is super super deep and really interesting which i'm looking forward to getting into more um, can't wait to get back into stores and play some draft as well but yeah i mean the the one draft i've done so far felt felt very interesting you know everyone at the table had a slightly different approach to the draft i think and um paid different dividends for different <laughs> different players but yeah it was really interesting Awesome. Well, take us into the news, Aiden. Yeah, so first thing is there's been a big change to the ELO rating system from uh, Legend Story Studios, just published literally uh, yesterday when we record this, so earlier in the week once you listen to this, but um, they have, you know, ELO is something that has been talked about in terms of the way that they can rate professional events and moving forward, it's going to be an important thing for qualifying for certain events, especially professional level events, whether it be uh nationals pro tours they haven't seen exactly what that qualification process looks like but now we have a uh, split rating system so limited and constructed elo systems the leaderboards are now split out um, so that and uh, 
you know what what Alice has said in, in their article is that um, so that players can master the different formats and um, have the sort of I guess the the rewards paid for those in terms of how they then qualify for future events based on that mastery of those uh, two different formats. So they've said that this will apply to global and country level where applicable. So really interested to see sort of what that means as we move forward. But this feels like the first sort of step in uh, how the ELO ratings are going to be used in probably the future with the 2022 um, you know, pro level play and the events that we know are going to come with the first, first lot of pro tours and then Worlds, which is slated for November at this point. So um, yeah, well, I don't know. What were your thoughts on that, Brennan? <laughs> Um, yeah, it's cool. Like, I like the idea. Uh, the execution, definitely, I wasn't a fan of. Just in the sense that, like, if we had known this before the, the Vegas calling, like, most of the people that dropped out to, dropped day two because it was just impossible to top eight probably would have played it for ELO. Because uh, we were all, like, pretty much aware that ELO was going to contribute to Pro Tour invites. Um, so I wish this would have, like, they would have just told us about this. Because yeah, now it's pretty so. awkward. Yeah, it's a really awkward situation because it's a split. Um, so it was actually it ended up being very net negative for me to not play day two and play that PTI, which some people can be like, I don't know, some people maybe don't understand how you know how it works, may think that that's like justice, but dropping day two is not something that I, I wanted to do. Um, it's just the EV on playing the PTI was so ridiculously more than playing the event. Um, that's what I do. So very disappointed in it coming at the time it did. Um, I just wish they could have given us a heads up. I think it would have solved even. I think it would have even solved a lot of the gripes people had with the uh, the way the calling was. Uh, you know, some people complained about not being able to top base. So I think that would have stemmed that as well. So it seems like all benefited come earlier. But I do understand. You know, sometimes out of your control. Overall, I like it though. the The core concept is that you know, limited players and constructed players alike will have kind of relatively um, equal chance to play on the pro tour i think that's absolutely and i think it's an awesome thing i'm totally behind it and yeah i'm excited for where that will take us in the future yeah it's i guess it's not clear as in terms of um will we have limited only pro tours will we have mixed pro tours like has been seen in other games you know would it be purely constructed would it be purely limited would it be a mix of the two so it's it's not it's not i think immediately clear which of these two streams will qualify you for what exactly um so whether it could be the top you know i don't know Let's just throw a random number out there. Top twenty from each qualifier for Pro Tour one, or will it be okay? It's a constructed, it's a constructed Pro Tour, so the top fifty of the constructed um, leaderboard are qualified. So that's that's the interesting thing, I think. Um, and yeah, to your point, right? Like playing that calling, if top sixteen means you know a really big growth in your elo, which probably qualifies you or gets you on the way to qualifying for say the first Pro Tour, then that's like a really big incentive to, as you say, stay in the main event and continue playing. So. Um, yeah, I think obviously they probably had this in the works. There's probably a few things behind the scenes. It's a really big piece of work as well. I think in terms oh, of yeah. the ELO system, because um, you'll notice that if you if you did play in the calling or you've played in a calling or you've played in a rated event before, like a nationals, uh, it does take time for those leaderboards to update. And I think that's because there's a lot of work that has to go on at the moment behind it. Not sure if these new leaderboards change that and make it a bit easier for LSS, but it's, it seems to be a reasonably big undertaking. So yeah, excited to see uh, see what happens next. But you know, Brennan, you're you're not badly positioned on that on that limited leaderboard at fourteenth. Uh, you got Dallas calling coming up. You could uh, you could yet climb up that leaderboard. Yep, absolutely. Look to do that. I mean, um, grinding uh, like rated ELO as a as a way to be on the pro tour or get PTIs is um, a lot. Like it's a lot more attainable um, to some people than you know just like having to go to like a thousand player event and you having to land in the top eight. Uh, and that will just become, I think more and more like hard to do as the um, aggregate player pool just gets better at the game, um, which is where it'll be. So I love, I really like that. That is a possibility, like a route to, to join the play, t- the, the pro tour. Cause you know, if you, like if you played, if someone got, you know, fourth at a, at a calling and then they got 756 at the next four, but you got ninth every time. Um, I mean, they're not necessarily like it up, a much better player than you strictly right there's more nuance so i like that that system exists yeah yeah it's uh longevity over time right of events like that that is yeah, i agree i like that um yeah well let's see let's see what you do at dallas i think a solid day two finish and you'll you'll climb above me and then i'll be a sad hayden so <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's move on um the calling so the calling uh, Las Vegas. All those videos are now up on uh, Fab TCG. Just noticed that over the week they were uploading all those videos to the official Fab TCG YouTube channel. So if you are still yet to go and check out uh, the Vegas event, all rounds are up, including day one, day two, top eight. Um, all the feature matches are up. Uh, and if you have checked them out, maybe you want to go back and watch them or you know have a look at 
some ideas for decks as we head into the new meta there was a lot of different heroes played on camera which is uh which is cool so you can go check those out uh, yeah we... check out round three let me know what you think <laughs> 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 yeah so there yeah, i'm uh, that's obviously that's my round so you'll see but um it's up there if you want to go check it out from the calling we're going to start a tally of um arsenal pass hosts and games one on camera um so you know brendan it's uh off to a rocky start. Hopefully, you can improve that in Dallas. <laughs> Just fine. Oh, one. Let's go. Um, next up, yeah, just want to say we had uh, a couple of gameplay videos go up in the past week. Uh, so, we've got a, a sealed Tales of Aria gameplay that's gone up. We also have our first class constructed gameplay of the new set got with Tales of Aria, where Lexi is being played, which is exciting. And then, as well, our latest time in the round is up, uh, where we did have Dem Amada come on. I know that was uh, people were excited to see Dem Amada on Arsenal Pass, and it was great to have him on. And we talked about, you know, casting and Vegas and his future plans for Flesh and Blood, um, which is yeah, it was really cool to do. And and Brendan, who have we got coming up this week? Yeah, so next week I'm really excited for. Um, we have Zach Bond from Team Covenant. Team Covenant, um, I think, has been pivotal in making the game what it is today. They were really the first big what felt to be the first big commercialized jump of flesh and blood in the United States. Um, and I've had the pleasure of meeting both Steven and Zach multiple, or, you know, I only met Steven in Vegas. I've met Zach multiple times now. And I mean, you really couldn't ask for kind of a better, um, you know, mascot or just kind of person to be spearheading that side of the game. Um, they're just, they're great people. They're competitive players and they're very much focused on getting better. And yeah, um, honestly, both of them are just are just a joy. So I'm excited to you know kind of see them as the game grows and as we're able, you know, we'll see them at more events. But uh, very excited as well to have Zach on for time of the round. Awesome. And I do want to say, you know, me and Hayden both do want to say a thank, big thank you to all of our patrons. We have almost over 150 now. It's been incredible what these this Patreon has allowed us to do. Um, it's freed up so much time for me and Hayden and allowed us to put out you know higher quality content. Uh, our Patreon, if you are interested in it, we do do a lot of special and exclusive content on there, mostly additional kind of stuff. So we have deck text. So if we have deck text on the main channel, the Patreon will have sort of the fully written up sideboard guide, the deck theory, um, usually an Excel sheet with all the ratios, math, literally everything you know to pick up the deck and start being competitive with it. Um, as well as that, we do have you know live sessions with our patrons. I think the next one is coming up on this weekend. Yeah, we let the patrons choose a topic, and then you know all get in a Discord call and go ahead and you know do a usual Arsenal Pass episode, except there's weird questions and you get to participate. So those are really awesome, and yeah, just a huge thank you to anybody who has joined our Patreon. You have you know let us kind of go um, take it to the next level. Cool. And just lastly, I want to say, Brendan, we, of course, as I said, our first Tales of Aria gameplay is up with Class Constructed. Love to hear uh, your thoughts. Are like, what, what heroes would you like to see us play on camera? Um, you know, we the words are oyster, right? So uh, let us know what you want to see. Obviously, the meta feels really open right now. So a lot of different ways to attack heroes as well, which is something we're about to talk about in the main topic of the pod. But um, yeah, we can definitely try and service some uh, some suggestions for gameplay. Oh, Hayden, I had a good one. What about a chain mirror post seas ban? <laughs> do you know what I just kind, kidding i kind of want to do that <laughs> no that is that is bottom of the list all right um uh, well i'm feeling a bit tired myself today so i'm not going to bring us into some elaborate way into the command and cookout slash section but it is back so hayden takes to the grill what it's you got the, it's the triumphant return of the, of the yeah. command and cookout section i think um and we have, a, we have a great question this week so this week's question comes from a uh, long time listener actually jason Lai, uh who i think has been an arsenal pass list, uh, listener since basically week one if not in our first couple of episodes so i just want to say thank you jason for all your support and thank you for your questions so um jason actually sent us in a, a great email um and he says well jason says this is my question i'm curious about when you refer to sculpting your hand when does the act of sculpting come into consideration and how do you evaluate your cards or so slash your hand during these moments I can see two scenarios that would be interesting to hear uh, our opinion on, or maybe whatever uh, we think is relevant. So Jason does break this into two parts, Brennan, and then we're going we're gonna to jump in. Um, and I did want to say as well, Jason, uh, thank you again for the question. This is actually a question that Jason sent in uh, about a month and a half ago, but we have you know, been through season of spoilers and uh, we haven't got back to the Commander Cookout. So apologies, Jason, for you know leaving your question for a few weeks. So Jason does say, sculpting on the block, do you sculpt when you're defending? Uh, so at this moment, are you considering to accomplish things such as how much pitch you're going to need for your turn, how much damage you can take, and how you might need to disrupt your opponent's game plan? And then 
Inversely, Jason also says, sculpting on the attack, is it possible to get in um, some chip damage and keep powerhouse cards for the future? Uh, all while crossing your fingers, hoping that you don't lose any cards on your opponent's next swing. Uh, the thing that's he says is annoying is when you've got the combo pieces and your opponent's uh, attacks with something that'll wreck your hand or forces you to block. Um, Jason says, often when I play Zorinthia and hope that I see the cards I need for a big turn, uh, but my, you know, my deck is completely random on the first cycle, apart from fetching things like uh, with Singing Steel Blade on the prize. So yeah, that's that's Jason's email asking about I guess, sculpting on defense and um, offense, Brendan. Mm-hmm. Well, Hayden, well, since you read the question, I'll let you <laughs> I take a start. jab at it first. So. Yeah, so I, I think there's a, there's a few things in here, right, which is a, a lot of different concepts that we talk about. But if we take it to a base level, right, effectively what Jason is asking about is a turn cycle, is effectively like how, first of all, if, are we sculpting on the block? Always, right? That's when you that's where you're really starting to sculpt your hand because when you draw up at the end of your turn, the first thing you're going to be doing is defending with that hand or, you know, your opponent's going to have their turn with that hand. So you're going to be, you know, gas tank's full, hands full, the opponent comes in with their turn. So immediately the first thing, that's the that's the start of your new turn cycle, right? Effectively, that is the next, your opponent's turn and your next turn that can be played off that hand. So when it comes to defending your opponent's turn and you know sculpting or quote unquote sculpting that hand, uh, the, the first point of, of, uh, of interaction you get to do that is when your opponent makes a move, right? And generally it's gonna be when they attack. So, Effectively, you know, you're starting to look at things like, yeah, okay, what is what does my turn look like? like? What could the best of my turn look like? What's my best damage output here? Um, then you're often, you know, working backwards, right? So, okay, well, I have a three card hand here uh, that could deal 12 damage. And then I have this fourth card, which could, you know, give me an extra two damage. It could go on Arsenal or it could defend for three. Uh, so that's that's like a, a good starting point, right? And then you're trying to, you know, work out to, to Jason's point, you know, about um, how much damage you can take. Well, it's not just damage that you need to consider. It could be an on-hit effect. Uh, it could be your opponent advancing their game plan significantly. So then you're starting to weigh up your four-card or five-card hand if you have your arsenal into what your opponent's doing. Um, and those are like the kind of the biggest key things to start with when you talk about sculpting on the block. And if you're... If you can then get past that point of, you know, just, just basically playing the game out turn cycle to turn cycle to try and get the most advantage, that's when you really start to get into, I guess, like the core concept of like of a sculpting your hand for the next turn cycle. And that's about, you know, not just that turn cycle itself, but it's like the future of the game. So maybe there's a card in your hand, uh, like a like a singing steel blade, like an iron song determination, that if you can get that card into Arsenal, then you're on your way to setting up a really strong five card hand into the future. You know, those combo pieces that that Jason, um, Jason's talking about there. How can you protect those cards, you know, to that point without getting, you know, your hand blown up or your opponent coming in with the right attack. And that, um, that, that really moves on to like playing both sides of the board. So thinking about what your opponent can or can't do in any given turn or point of the game. And I think a good example of this, right, is is um, playing into Bravo maybe. So you might be really worried about like crippling crush or like crush attacks, things like that. As soon as your opponent's playing off, you know, four card hands, that's going to be a bit more difficult for them to, you know, unleash a dominated crippling crush on you. Uh, you know, it's going to require a lot more, a lot more from this. It's going to require exactly the right hand, three blues plus the crippling crush. So in those situations, that's when you can start to, to try and set up and sculpt your hand a bit more for a future turn cycle. So say we're, we're talking about two turn cycles. On the first turn cycle, you might get a card into Arsenal. And then on your second turn cycle, your opponent just has four cards in hand. You're going to feel a lot better about trying to set up your your combo, you know, your quote unquote combo, uh, because your opponent doesn't have quite the power they need to come into you and, and disrupt that. So um, it's not like there's, there's, I think basically in, in Jason's questions, to be honest, there's almost every concept of sort of like core flesh and blood in there. But if you take it back to like step one, which is like sculpting on the block and sculpting on the attack, it really is winning a turn cycle. It's like, what does, what does, and, and it starts on your opponent's turn because that's when your, when your gas tank is full, right? Yeah. I mean, I think the, the biggest, probably one of the biggest noob traps in flesh and blood is playing four card hands, like just kind of blasting your four card hands into your opponent just back to back to back to back maximizing damage all that good stuff even maximizing blocks um the also saw is very powerful i think uh, there's a lot of decks especially in constructed that are completely predicated off playing a five card hand um and you know kind of creating that five card hand is a part of sculpting um i also like the thing that jumps out to me with this question is something like um two artivores in chain so let's say you artivore and you draw another artivore you always have the option to do another plus one give it go again but usually, the right choice, almost, I would say 90% of the time, it changes if you're presenting lethal or if you think you won't get another turn. 
um, you're actually going to go ahead and arsenal that artifact and not play it out. Just go on ahead and have a big turn, you know, probably 15 to 20 plus damage, which is what artifact turns look like. Then you arsenal the artifact and you do it again on the next turn. It's much more disruptive usually to do it back to back on each turn than it is to, you know, kind of have like one big 25 plus or almost, you know, something like that damage turn. So um, I very much consider that sculpting and I think it was actually a big part of chain back in Monarch. Yep, I agree. The, the, the crazy thing, right, is that um, these concepts may sound pretty basic, but I actually think that in the Monarch meta of Class Constructed, we really moved away from some of these core concepts of, of sculpting a hand throughout the whole game, of turn cycles throughout the whole game, because uh, it was a very it was a very aggressive format. It was a very, um, you know, tempo-based format where players would... I don't even know if, it's, if I'm saying tempo-based is actually the right, the right way to go about it, but basically there was really... Often seeing the second cycle of your deck was not... Uh, a consideration unless it was your only consideration right so some decks that wanted to fatigue then the second cycle of your deck was like the biggest consideration but outside of that just the the end-to-end game of you know going through one cycle of the deck then getting into the mid game uh and then getting into the end game where you cycle back through your deck and start to play back into your second cycle wasn't really a big part of the monarch constructed meta whereas you know crucible before that or arcane rising before that that was it was quite a big consideration and those are really where i think a lot of people learned the core fundamentals mm -hmm. so i think in monarch you know if, if you if you're a player who joined in the monarch meta uh, you might have skipped over a lot of these like fundamentals of winning a turn cycle sculpting hands uh for early mid and end game because they were just to be honest that that uh, strategy and that um tactic and those skills were just a lot less important in the last format and i think early kind of indications of this format and playing some tales of aria mm -hmm. feels like some of those core competencies are really going to be a consideration in this format and really come back in, in a big way. And, you know, some of the first games I was playing last week, I was kind of caught off guard by sort of how poorly I was playing some lines because it's been so long since I've had to consider a lot of just those core, uh, you know, the end really basic uh, fundamentals of flesh and blood. So while, you know, Jason's question feels like quite a, a surface level question about sculpting and, and winning turn cycles, I think it's actually a lot more about um how you sculpt for the long term as well so yeah i think great question there from jason awesome well thank you again jason for the question if you guys or sorry if you all do want to send in a question to us you can shoot that to arsenalpassfab at gmail.com again that's arsenalpassfab at gmail.com anyway Hayden, talk to me about the heroes of class construction in the new meta yeah, let's jump straight into the main topic and I think a great, as I say, a great lead in to what the Tales of Aria Constructed Meta is looking like uh, from Jason's question there. So, you know, with the banning of Seeds and of course Dustblade as well before release, the format, you know, is really in for a big shake up alongside the release of Tales. Today we're going to talk about, you know, from our perspective, where some of the heroes or where actually all the heroes, we're going to go through all of them, even if we only touch on some of them, I uh, believe they're shaking up as we head into this meta. So. You know, which heroes have the best chance of success, uh, which heroes might struggle a bit more, what heroes might be find themselves around the middle of the pack. We're also going to talk about some of the, I guess, early, mid and, and late uh, implications of what this class constructive format might look like. So, you know, weeks one, two, three and four through to the mid of this meta as we hit into national season um, and just how we think this might start to shape up and just give some indications of maybe, you know, good places to start for heroes to build into strategies and archetypes to look at. Uh, or even, you know, if you have a favorite hero, how maybe you might want to go about trying to play that hero in the early part of this meta. Um, so I thought, Brennan, as like, you know, kind of a discussion point to start, why don't we talk about what we think um, the pace of the format is going to look like? You know, if we talk about, we did just talk about it a little bit in uh, Jason's question there, but in the modern constructed meta, you know, you'd say it was a pretty fast meta. You know, there was a lot of, the obvious chain really defined that meta and the speed of that deck. Uh, we saw, you know, a lot of, other aggressive decks or decks that tried to push big damage over turns to end games quickly. Um, but we also did see, you know, fatigue decks that tried to, I guess, attack the format in a different way. So that's where we were. Where are we, where are we headed? Yeah, I do want to talk about this point. So if you listen to Arsenal Pass um, and, you know, kind of anything that we've been saying since, uh, you know, spoiler started, we always said ice, 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 you know, like we were hyper-focused on ice. We are le like ice has just become such a, such a less defining part of the format in my opinion. Cause like every time I was talking about ice defining the future format and slowing it down, I was saying that in the context of chain, just like dominating. Right. Um, but now the chain doesn't look like he's going to be dominating. I do think that ice is still legit. Like it's still uh, an archetype. It's still good. Um, 
but it's not instantly going to be kind of the knee jerk reaction that all the meta goes to. Cause I feel like if once, if we had gone into tales of Aria, um, cause Dr. Meta with both chain, uh, you know, everything's still unbanned. Like it would, it would have been chain players and then ice players mostly as like sort of a defining kind of polarizing side of the meta. But now, nowadays I don't think so much. I do think that with ice that the port format will slow down. I think it's almost impossible for the format to kind of speed up. Maybe it will, maybe there will be some kind of crazy broken aggro deck. I doubt it. Um, but I am myself, I'm looking towards mid range decks and I'm looking towards decks that have evasion and can punish slow decks. I still think there's going to be a lot of people jumping back onto control and attrition strategies mostly because that strategy was kind of eh, in Monarch, right? And a lot of people liked that. And I felt like that was taken away from a lot of people. So as we're going to Tales and you've seen kind of this, you know, sort of a, you know, important uh, talent or whatever that kind of leads into that being Ice or something. I just see a lot of people going in control. So I want to be at a mid-range deck that can deal with aggro decks, deal with all the mid-range decks, obviously, but can also use Evasion to heavily punish these slower decks. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just wanted to say when you, when you said about... Uh, I guess the format and and the kind of games you're looking to play. I had such a such a good time in the past week playing Less Constructed with the new set. I felt like I was having to grind out games. I felt like my decisions on both the offensive side and the defensive side with my hands in a turn cycle were really crucial. Uh, and you know I could actually sculpt over sort of like two or three turns uh, how I wanted to play play out a game. Maybe find a pivot turn, swing tempo, things like that. So. I'm, I'm excited to see where we go with the pace of the format. I do think in the early weeks, we're probably going to see a bit of a contrast between players trying to attack the format uh, in a pretty aggressive manner. So, you know, I would I would expect to potentially even see like lightning decks come out uh, to see maybe Katsu Aggro still hanging around to see, uh, you know, other aggressive decks that just want to try and punish people for, you know, effectively playing maybe a bit of a jankier list or early list that might get punished for that sort of thing. But I also expect that we'll see, you know, we'll see ice builds, like you say, we'll see uh, these attrition based like uh, decks that want to grind people down a lot of defense reactions um things like that so and then i think probably what we'll actually see just in terms of pace of format is i actually think we will move to a mid more mid-range decks like you talk about um like this kind of diversion point in the meta as players start to try and work out the best ways to flex their strategies um mm-hmm. they start to tune lists it's a lot easier at that point once you have a bit more information about the meta to build lists that can potentially move either side of the of the line if you're on a mid-range list maybe you move a little bit more towards the aggressive side in some matchups but defensive in some matchups depending on on how you take the attack the meta or uh, maybe you have more of a five cut hand build versus more of a defensive build so um yeah that's probably where i think the pace of the format will, will shake up brendan but i'm i'm excited to say that it feels open right now it feels like that pace of the format oh, could go it, either way it's cracked wide open i mean chain really was the I mean, that was the deck of Monarch. I mean, everything was built around Chain. You had to have game versus Chain if you wanted to even exist. And a lot of people actually felt that you had to play Chain if you even just wanted to compete. Um, that's just gone. Like, I, I know that some people were like, yeah, I played Chain in early Monarch and I had a build that maybe had less Seeds or was less reliant. Seeds was just so pivotal to it's not an end game card it's an early game card it's a mid game card and it's the end game card it was just the most important card in chains like you have to think about things like how do you build ursa how do you have end games and how do you come with a one cost attack and swing the nebula blade for four like nebula blade is so much worse now um so i think that the you know chain has definitely gone from maybe tier zero maybe he goes down to tier two could still hover around low tier one but it just cracks the, the meta right open like right open i have no clue what is going to be dominant in this meta. I know we're going to see a lot of Prism, you know, and some other things we'll get into later, but it, the met, like if you enjoy being creative and using deck building as a way to get an edge on other players, this is like your time. Um, more than almost any time in the past in Flesh and Blood, in my opinion. Mm. Some spoiler alerts there for your thoughts on Chain. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> the... 100%. I mean, the start of a new meta should always be like a, an oasis for deck builders, right? Um, but now, you know, more so than ever because some of the established metagame that you often walk into in a new format, you know, where you have an established metagame, a set comes out and then you adapt to the set. Now we're actually, it feels like to your point, you know, with, with the bannings and with the, the changes that we have a lot more of a wide open field, which is super exciting. So on that, Brendan, I did want to talk about, so we've talked about the pace of the format. We feel that, yes, it could it's very likely to slow down uh, to some extent to what extent that is you know with the impact of ice with uh, attrition based decks with the fact that uh you know the 
ability for people having to race chain as it were might not be you know it's not as, as important what will they look like pace probably slows down right initially anyway and we'll see what that looks like what will i guess the next piece what will some of the defining characteristics of um this format be and some of the really key gameplay patterns that define the tales of aria classic constructed meta i, I might start brennan i think that uh the first thing i think is going to be important and we've kind of already alluded to even talked about this already today I think that we're going to see the pitch become so more important uh, and that setting up for end games, considering your pitch turn after turn, not just, you know, oh, I need to get these three cards because when I get fatigued, I need to finish on this turn, etc. No, no, no. About, you know, really managing the resources in your deck, managing your second cycle so that when you uh, get into these mid and end games that you, uh, you've set up a better second cycle than your opponent. I think these are things that are going to really uh, matter in this new format. I agree, um, and I'm excited for it too. It's not uh, just so I know that there's sometimes like a, a pushback on this when we say stuff like this. It doesn't mean memorizing your pitch completely, but like just think about a long game of class constructed. If someone's pitched like a blood rush bellow and like reds at the bottom of their deck, and you're a Dorinthia that's pitched all blues, I mean, yeah, you got to think of like the second cycle of the deck is like a level ten versus like a level one. Like <laughs> you just that's what you want to play for is you need like threat density and you need to have a deck that can compete in the you know in the second cycle obviously you know it gets a bit thrown off because your life is no longer 40 in the second cycle or it's very unlikely to be sometimes it is um but yeah i mean pitching mindfully maintaining a power level in your deck all these kinds of things that were a bit less relevant um in monarch unless you were playing chain then i think that they're going to come back and come back in force yeah yeah, I like I like the mindfully pitching uh, statement there. I think I might steal that for future. <laughs> as, as <laughs> Mindfulness a while pitching. Yeah, mm. exactly. <laughs> but but one of the I think I just wanted to give this a bit more explanation because we we have definitely talked about this in the past, but I think more so in the context of limited and much less so during the monarch season. But I think there's three sort of distinct I guess um, levels to pitching, and the the first is really that you you just you know go about your kind of business you just play your game out you play your four card hands out right the next level is you know you're pitching you're you're being <laughs> mindful of your pitch i'm gonna use that term because i like it you know you're thinking about okay well i could i could pitch this yellow here or i could pitch this blue here uh and do the same turn so i'm gonna pitch this yellow because this card has better you know better threat density late game uh it's an important card that i might want to see back whereas this blue is just another resource and Actually, last turn I pitched three blues, so I'm gonna have four blues and, and a chunk on the bottom of my deck. Um, that's not gonna be great for my end game, you know. Or uh, I have, I'm playing a sink below. I'm actually gonna tuck this, you know, like really gas red card at the bottom of my deck for for later in the game. Uh, maybe I'm putting a crippling crush at the bottom, and I know I've just pitched three blues. So, you know, you don't have to memorize your pitch, but just knowing, oh, I'm trying to do something. I'm trying to affect an end game. And then kind of the third level is just being mindful of what your opponent's doing as well. So. You know, if you're playing, to, to Brennan's earlier point, if you're playing into a game and your opponent is just like pitching all blues, they're just like throwing everything at you, they're just like going, you know, pedal to the middle on the first cycle and, you know, you're able to, you know, set up a little bit of an end game. You get a few sort of threats to the bottom of your deck, um, but maybe you just make the decision, okay, well, I'm just going to be like really defensive and play for the second cycle of my deck because I know that my second cycle of my deck is so much better than my opponent's 11 blues and three yellows that they've got at the bottom of the deck. So... Um, they just want to go back and talk about that sort of level of pitching again to Brent's point you don't have to memorize your pitch it's just about being aware of of the kind of what is being pitched by you know ideally both players if you can get to that point um, it does definitely take some practice but the more you sort of think about it the more you sort of uh, work on it you'll find it and you know um, it's pretty it's usually about the same amount of turns to get back to the, the first turn cycle you know because it's generally four card hands throughout the game um, so you know once you get through 12 depending on how many cards are drawn you know 12 15 turns of a game you can um you know what's going to happen so yeah anyway Brendan, any other sort of i guess key characteristics or defining gameplays the other thing i did yeah. think about is um like synergies and combos i think are going to be uh on the up especially synergies i think we definitely saw five card hands be important in um in monarch but i think actually my first take on this format is that five cut hands might be played less because you're playing turn cycles more, but they are more important in this format. Yeah. So obvious things that come to mind are, you know, blood rush mellow stacks with barraging beatdowns, Mordred tied on big cards, like five card hands, um, you know, things like that, where you're going to kind of have multiple pivots throughout a game. If that's a kind of correct word that you would describe it with. Yeah. 
Still played Supremacy turns and Dorinthia, you know, plus Iron Song Determination, just sitting up these five card hands. Um, you know, maybe with Lexi, that's like three of a kind hands um, that you're trying to set up. So these these hands feel like these five card hands or <laughs> maybe six card hands, depending on what deck you're playing, uh, feel like they're going to have pretty, uh, you know, pretty reasonable impact. I think in the last format to try and combat decks like Chain or even um, even trying to combat decks like Prism to an extent in terms of with the way that they could defensively hold a game, uh, players would look to set up these five card hands, right? Like look to find you a good five card hand. But in this game, uh, I think the synergies are also, or this format, sorry, the synergies are also going to be really important. So the not just the, the five cut hands is just like a big damage turn, but just like the synergistic nature of what your hands are going to do. And I think like Mordred Tide, for instance, is like a really good example. You know, if I'm playing maybe a, a Viscerai Mordred Tide deck, um, am I trying to set up for these Mordred Tides like early game, mid game, late game? And then like, how do the rest of my cards interact with, with that card? Um, I'm not necessarily looking for like a two card combo. I'm looking for like just good synergistic turns that are going to be able to push damage, take tempo, help me pivot turns. Um, so, and I think, you know, actually Dorinthia is a great example of, of that kind of uh, ability where your it's non-attack actions like a nature's path pilgrimage or like a, like a steel blade supremacy that we just talked about interact with some of your other cards in your deck, like your reprise based, um, attack reactions. So that's what I'm talking about when I say, you know, the synergies of the deck, it's less about just like raw damage, you know, it's not just like scar for scars and life for lives and E strikes and command and conquers necessarily. I think that we're going to see a lot more focus on. On um, synergistic natures of decks, cards, and um, game plans, which I'm excited about. Yeah, and kind of lastly here to wrap it up, um, I see us entering a more rock paper scissors format. Um, I think that you know Monarch was more of a chain paper scissors format. Um, you had to be able to be chain, and chain kind of seemed to have an edge on most things. And a lot of our sideboards reflected that. You were actually most decks. I mean, especially chain was very ready for every single yeah you know, kind of. Uh, opponent he could run into right uh, throughout the sideboard but as the hero pool expands and as we move away from you know what maybe you could collo- kind of colloquially call colloquially call broken decks like chain that could just be good against everything um you might enter what we you know a, a format's rock paper scissors where you maybe you can't have a sideboard that just is over 50 percent on this hero maybe you do have that bad matchup things like that i felt like uh at least in monarch um i was pretty comfortable into into you know a totally blind meta but moving into tales of aria um i do think those cyborg slots are going to be very tight and it's going to be extremely hard to replicate that in the new format yeah i don't think is uh, i is, is that a rock paper scissors format it feels like it's like rock paper scissors xxx like it feels like this format is so wide open especially initially like maybe we move to a bit more clear cut with you know control beats aggro aggro beats combo whatever it is um but i feel like in the the early stages at least um it's it's so wide open i think in terms of what what decks might try and do and actually that's what i want to talk about as well as like you don't even know what necessarily hero uh, sorry what game plan you're going to play against when a, a player flips over a hero i think moving forward um, you know, we saw this in the last format to a degree, you know, we started to see it in Monarch, say Bolton flips over on the other side of the table, are they <laughs> a Duskblade build, you know, a Raiden build, or are they, a, are they a Sabres combo build? They flip over Prism, uh, okay, are they like a more aggressive Herald based deck, or are they like, the, you know, like Control Prism, and we're you know, probably going to see more of that. They flip over, um, you know, I'm trying to think of other examples, uh, Katsu, are they Control, are they aggro? So. We already started to see it in the last format. I think we're going to see it more because some of these decks become viable to play in different ways. They flip over Viscerai. Are they OTK or are they like a mid-range based deck? Like, Yeah, it's even worse too. It's like uh, they flip over Lexi. Are they Lightning or they Ice? Are they Ice Lightning? Exactly. Uh, and they're yeah. quite different. Um, yeah, it's really accentuated with the the new heroes. For the Bolton thing, I would always you know, talk to my opponent first and I would judge them based on their character if they were going to play <laughs> Sabres or not. And it was usually correct. <laughs> Obviously, I'm kidding, but you know, I love to take my digs at Saber Bolton players. That's right, they took their digs back at you at the calling. So, I know. <laughs> all right, we're, we're gonna move on to, I guess, the third part of, of uh, you know, mid expectations and, and heroes. We're gonna talk about archetypes. So, we've already actually, it's funny, I think, you know, when we were writing out or I was writing out the notes of these, I didn't think we'd kind of talk about archetypes, but I think it all really rolls into just what this format's going to look like. But let's let's define it a bit more. So which archetypes do we think are most likely to find success? Maybe in the early uh, throws of the format, mid and late. 
And is it going to change and how's it going to change? So you already talked about, Brennan, mid-range is something that you're looking to, you know, to go with. Um, maybe you want to explain, like, what, obviously you've said, like, because you want to go under control decks and, and, you know, maybe go over aggro decks. But what makes mm. you think that that's going to be one of the better strategies in this format? So if you if you talk about it like that, like under control decks or aggro decks, that's like more like a, a theory perspective, right? Like sure. kind of like macro theory, right? Where it's like there, there's another piece of macro theory, which is like uh, an aggro deck is always the best thing to bring into like a, a very young format, right? Mm -hmm. But the reason why I'm looking at mid-range decks is because I think that ice will be prevalent and I want a deck that's not going to fold when I have my resources or my arsenal tax or something like that. And something like mid-range does that a lot better. Um, specifically things like Reinar. If you think about like, Reinar just looks like it has kind of a very good tool set. So let's say, let's say Bra we'll talk about this more later. Let's say Bravo pushes Dash out of the format. Um, and, you know, you're looking at Reinar, one of the most popular decks might be Prism. You're very favored against that. Um, you know, if you go into like an Ice Old Him or something like that, any of these control, you have Evasion, these barraging beatdowns versus Ranger, you know, um, hitting them before and then coming in with the command and conquer at the end or command and conquer pummel something that i actually think is going to be a marquee of the set that's going to conquer pummel um it just looks like it like reinar just looks to be amazingly well positioned um in my opinion just from a theory base and i think the same thing for other mid-range decks like viscera like viscera also looks very strong and you're right like you will you kind of fundamentally have game versus you know both control decks and aggro decks um but ultimately I think you're able to dance around the new the introduction of ice better than any other archetype. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, yeah, I can get on board with that. Yeah, it's really interesting on like mid range, and I think I agree as well, Brendan. What we've seen in the past is like mid range decks tend to do well into the maturity of a format, and that's because the meta game solidifies, right? Like you you know which heroes to expect, you know which strategies and archetypes to expect. So uh, mid range decks can tend to deal better with like. Uh, polarizations of formats as well or specific heroes so maybe there's an aggressive deck that does well but there's a control deck that does well so it's easier to play mid-range probably to deal with that than it is any other archetype and mid-range tends to be able to adapt and flex their game plan better because they have more cards in their base deck typically that they can uh, push either way and you know there's good examples of this in, in previous formats like uh, like the dash deck um, we've even seen like a bolton decks do this in the past format bravo uh you know i know you played all this, Brendan, at Road to Nationals. That was very much sort of more of a mid-range Bravo deck. Um, and we have seen it with, like, the introduction of, like, you know, Zealous Beltings and um, Pummel Plans and things like that. So it's not something new, but it is something that uh, in this format as hero, you know, we get more and more heroes. Uh, it might be harder to do. Uh, you might say that actually, in fact, and this is kind of, I guess, my sort of thought is that early on, uh, we're still going to see proactive game plans do really well. So whether that be... Um, archetypes that are aggressive in nature with with their with their um, proactiveness or maybe they're like more combo based in, in their proactiveness but I think that those are decks that I think will do early do well early in the first few weeks just because uh, they they work well into open metas right to your point like the the old adage of like bring an aggro deck to week one tournament because uh, you don't know what people are going to play and people's decks will be a bit a bit uh, a bit untuned, untuned right yeah. yeah and if we talk about control here too um control is is also like what's what's funny about a lot of these concepts is they kind of go like every single way like control is also very good into an early format because people don't have like proactive and cohesive game plans to beat your like dirtily strategy um because sometimes it can be quite hard you can just attrition them run them out of stuff um, or just have like, you know, a general Bravo game plan where you, you are coming in with like crippling crusher, you know, spinal crush every two turns, every three turns. So shit, and then, you know, most decks that are untuned could wilt under that. So control definitely has this place as well. I think fatigue, like fatigue, I would yeah. be freaking surprised if that exists because fatigue was literally a, um, or fatigue, as they say, was <laughs> literally, a like a reaction to chain, um, it was a theoretical reaction to chain per se. So that that should be gone. It will it be there? Yes, it will. It will be there week one, week two. Don't get me wrong. It'll be there. Um, but that that should fade out of the meta very good. Fatigue is not actually a strategy in flesh and blood. It was there to combat one thing, which is what chain was doing. Other than that, you can't just like go fatigue every deck, right? You have and most if you looked at the calling, you looked at most of these fatigue decks, they had multiple game plans. They were not just pure fatigue decks. So fatigue should, and I hope that it is uh, going to be gone um even though i don't have i think it has zero chance of being dominant or winning i just hope that it, it's gone because it's boring for most people um to play against it um yeah i think the fatigue will be a thing of the past and control decks will still exist but they will look more kind of like you know maybe like bravo list used to look like and things like that 
Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to disagree with my co-host here slightly. <laughs> um, and then I think fatigue will still be... You actually, I mean, we agree on the fact that it's probably prevalent early in the meta, uh, but I actually think it's it's not a terrible week one strategy, but I think you have to, to caveat like fatigue and what that actually means, right? Because if we talked about fatigue, say in like the Welcome to Wraith meta, um, and we talked about like Bravo was like a good example of this, Bravo still had like a game plan that it could uh, could use with like it's a weapon, for instance, and and be somewhat proactive if needed or had these crippling crushes. Whereas the the fatigue that I guess now gets labeled out of the mono format was literally block everything, kill your opponent with their blood debt or they run out of cards. But if you have decks that aren't, you know, aren't milling themselves, you know, aren't pulling cards out of the deck and actively dealing themselves damage, uh, just a straight, straight up fatigue, block everything plan becomes very difficult to enact uh, because, you know, people can, okay, well, I'm just going to stack the bottom of my deck for a 50 damage turn and I have infinite time to get there and I have no pressure on my life total. Or, you know, I can actually just play double remembrance and so I don't run out of my best threats and I know that I can always push leak 10 damage with these hands. So things like that, right? So that's why I think the control style decks that look to fatigue opponents out of, um, you know, key resources while still putting on some pressure. So like more classical uh, katsu control decks, I think are probably pretty well positioned early on. Oh yeah, so I'll just throw it right back at you and say I just I disagree with my host. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I think that the the decks back in like Welcome to Wraith were way less powerful, which is why you yep. could fatigue something like a Dorinthia as Bravo. Um, but then fatigue was also just you know if it didn't have Drain of Brutality or part of the equation, it was kind of useless in the end there, as we saw. Um, but yeah, if Call to Control is a good deck. <laughs> Oh, I mean, I'll have to go. I'll have to go find uh, find God or something because I just don't see it. <laughs> I would. I wouldn't say if someone said to me at week one, I'm headed to a Tales of Aria class constructed tournament. Uh, I'm going to take Katsu Control. I wouldn't. I wouldn't be like oh, you have no chance to win the event. I would. I'd say it's probably a reasonable, <laughs> reasonable week one choice. I wouldn't. Probably wouldn't advocate it because I think if you come up with strong against stronger players in the top eight, you're going to struggle. But um. Yeah, it's really hard when we don't know what the format looks like, but I will say that the, the synergies in Tales of Aria uh, and just from Crucible of War and Monarch still around. Uh, there's still really powerful strategies to enact just because one of the most powerful strategies is gone. doesn't mean there isn't other powerful strategies out there. We saw the impact that Bolts and Sabres had on the format. We saw uh, the impact that... Um, you know, prism these prism aura decks had, and if you're playing control and you're not proactive against a prism aura deck, they're gonna just run you over. So, um, yeah, you know, Brendan. Yeah, I, def- I I think both of those uh, both those decks might not fall under my definition of fatigue. I think that the well, the prism the prism deck is, is definitely doing its own thing with the auras, right? But uh, Katsu control, gosh, there has to be huge like quotation marks on that because that is a <laughs> Definitely looks like a mid-range deck. That's what opinion. I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. I don't like these decks aren't actually fatigue, and I think that's why it's important to to qualify exactly what fatigue means. I think it got a bit of a different like these control slash fatigue decks got bucketed into one. I think with Monarch and and that's not really what they are, right? Like fatigue is like this this game plan. It's not an overall uh, strategy of of playing. I guess like. Of winning a flesh and blood event <laughs> so yeah sorry. for sure i mean it's okay like i'll definitely go out there and I'll, i'm willing to get flamed by saying that i think that cost control will still be the worst competitive deck in the format doesn't mean you can like you can't win with it um against like you know anything but uh, i just don't think it's a very good competitive deck all right well we're going to talk about heroes so we can get into that and we can debate that a bit further we're going to talk <laughs> about <laughs> some of the heroes first of all we're going to start with heroes that we think are going to do well they're set up for success they might even define this Tales of Aria meta, uh, be tier one um, heroes. These are the heroes that we think are, yeah, okay, basically going to have a good time as we enter the Tales of Aria meta. I'm going to start, Brendan. I'm going to talk about mm-hmm. Prism. I think, obviously, Prism just won the Las Vegas Calling. Uh, we've seen Prism, you know, in, in spades, you know, a lot through this road to national season. But the, the I guess, conversion rate and the success of Prism in the early part of that meta uh, was was not great. But as the format developed, um, players, you know, tuned those decks, came up with different game plans that weren't just, you know, I guess, straight up face race uh, herald decks with a bit of auras in them. Uh, they've been refined and we've seen, you know, we saw a, you know, Prism do well at Vegas with some, you know, really good day two conversion rate and obviously eventually putting a deck into top eight and, and the winner. So 
it's it's hardest matchup you know from if we look at tyler's deck for an example the hardest matchup of that deck is probably it's probably gone really in the, in the form of chain right the, this is a deck that tyler himself had said he felt like he was having really good success against bravos and um you know a lot of other decks in the format and now now chain's gone it's probably it's probably better for prism really right like this is a prism is in a better spot so it'll be interesting to see what these especially these aura based game plans um look like but i think they're in for at least for the early part of the meta a good time yep i think so as well like you definitely can't play down how many like prism on the calling so it should be rampant and i think a lot of people want to play prism which is like what the data what the story yeah if we pull like a story out of the data that's what it really tells us is like despite its really bad conversion rate throughout all of our nationals it was still like a very popular deck which means that people enjoy the character and want to play the deck um and want to make it work so now that it you know has a confirmation of working that that's only going to make it you know, much, much more popular. So I think the Prism is, I think Prism is actually the most defining class or hero in the meta and that you have to play around Prism it, when you, step one of building a deck is, do I have game versus Prism? The answer is no, probably not playing that deck early in the meta. Yeah, yeah, I agree. It's the, it's the, it's the like the deck with a, I guess a quote unquote target on its back coming out of the calling and coming to this new meta right it's the deck that stood the you know it's lived longer than chain it's going to be around um there's going to be multiple versions probably we're going to see the aura based version and uh, the more controlling version more prevalently i think but you know hero based decks are still going to be there so there's also this thing about okay well how do i be prepared for potentially both because it looks like both are probably going to be popular um, and I think to your point, the early early weeks of this meta are going to be, well, should I play this deck? Can I have a good matchup into the aura deck? And if you know, if if not, then probably I don't want to pick up this deck. And um, even how am I going to have a good uh, matchup into these these aura based decks? Like I don't think that's an easy answer. Uh, to be honest, like there's not just an obvious. So I play this because it does. Why? Like I think there's going to yeah, be- it's not right. Yeah. Like it's definitely not an easy answer. Um, you feel that in Bravo. But you know, you just you just throw on two Titans Fist or sorry, what is that? Is it Titans Fist? You throw yeah, on yeah. two, get yeah, put on the uh, put on the boots, put on the time skippers, and boom, get cracking or as like nobody's business. You hear their fist that's Brendan's um, pattern strategy on how to beat auras with uh, with Bravo. But yeah, I would I would yeah, probably that was a, that was a yoke, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> don't take that, don't do that. <laughs> if I was gonna pick up, you know, Prism week one, I'm um, definitely I think I'm picking up the Aura's plan. I think it has the the best um you know, my worst matchup is probably gone. So I'm I'm pretty happy to pick that deck up into we can maybe Katsu Agro is, is a tough one, but um otherwise I'm feeling feeling okay about it. Next up, uh Brennan, this is one that I think we both, you know, are pretty excited about, but Viscerai is something that we feel has uh definitely looking to i guess craft a place in the top tier of what might be the new meta um you know obviously chain had that title of you know rune blade to beat in the past format but viscerite gains a lot from this format so you know it gets the spellbound creepers which is a really powerful piece of of equipment in the boots there um and you know the mixed damage type that viscerite can put out across you know rune chance then just straight arcane damage from cards uh plus of course your physical damage is is really strong right like it is something that is, is not easy to combat and you couple that with the fact that you have the ability to reduce the cost of your cards you know with the rune chant cost reduction that can really combat for uh, you know frostbite tokens and ice as a deck so um you also have a lot of different weapons to choose from you know there's you know, you know you've got rosetta thorn that's come in there as well um you can't play dust blade unfortunately <laughs> but you have the thorn you have of course nebula blade you have reaping blade you have the dread scythe there's just you know there's a lot of options there for for you to play and angles of attack for these viscerai decks to take whether that be from um, you know, like OTK to aggro into mid range. Um, I think probably just personally, I think where we're going to see this deck probably find most success is in mid range to more aggressive decks that can really put on, uh, I guess, a lot of pressure with these mixed damage types um, and set up, you know, some intermediary, really, really big turns with cards like Mordred Tide. Agreed. I'm excited for Viscerai. Viscerai was actually really good in Monarch, um, but Chain just did it better, in my opinion. Um, so he's gotten some upgrades in Tails, and obviously I think the Chain is a thing of the past, or at least a thing of the competitive past, so I'm very much looking towards Viscerai, and it aligns with my mid-range ideology, where it can deal well into Ice, it's going to be a you know, more adaptable deck, um, and it can punish both. does have Evasion, right? does have the Arcane Damage, all that good stuff. So I'm very very excited for viscerai i am slightly worried about prism um yeah. the thing about prism though is that prism is 
obviously this this doesn't hold true as much for the aura plan but with prism it's always like yeah maybe i can just tech more for it if i just tech more for it i can make it easier right if i add more six attacks something like this or sevens uh ninth blades then it's kind of like always an option uh but then we get into like you know aura strategies and getting aura locked and you know tome or sorry what is it called? The Halo of Illumination for Tome of Divinity three mm-hmm. times in a row, all that good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fun stuff. Well, but yeah, excited for this, right? But I think the one thing before we move on is the one kind of concern I have with this array is that if you come into decks that um, have, you know, high blue counts, uh, high defensive ability, uh, you can actually run out of just like threats with uh, these Viscerai decks because they can basically, you know, a, a third of your threats probably in your deck are based off arcane damage and your opponent can just pitch cards to defend that. So in those matchups, you're really reliant on being able to set up um, really strong five card hands, uh, whether that be through, you know, first cycle, second cycle of your deck, um, Mordred Tide becomes a really important card. So that is probably like the one concern I have for Viscerai is like, how's it going to play? I think you need to be able to pre- be prepared to play into ultra defensive decks early on and you need to have a game plan that's going to lay to punch through that sort of um that barrier mm-hmm. now let's talk about some of the spice so two decks or two heroes that Hayden and i are very high on that other people may or not may or may not be so high on but this is also yeah you know, it addresses the prison problem um it's going to be levia and reiner and i know that there's a, a large amount of people that thought levia was unplayably just terrible in monarch it wasn't it was actually a good deck um it was very very strong it just could i we tested it and tested it and it was one of our favorite decks in the in the group but we couldn't get it over 50 but it was super explosive carrion husk is a great card um and so is you know art of war of course so levia and then you know having levia into like a prism dominated meta could be very very nice i'm very excited for levia and i would like to see if we can refine that deck more and maybe tune it a bit more um and see how it fares other than that reinar is kind of my go-to here mostly because reinar just has inherent evasion through like barraging beatdown and intimidate to get past all the dirtily decks right so if you have like this meta that's prism um your prism dominated you got reinar which really do- deals with that very very well and then you have a lot of other control decks ice decks things like that that you know, maybe they're even fatigue decks so like grandfathered over or something like that i mean you're in a great position it doesn't get any better than playing reinar right rip all the cards out of their hand and hit them for you know so much their the defensive values kind of do nothing so i'm mostly excited for reinar um and very hopeful for levia as well yeah um pound your chest for the brute boys right like or and girls um but reinar has like a really interesting like it's piece of of um flesh and blood i guess like gameplay right where it is you can build a proactive strategy that actively uh makes your opponent's defensive cards bad right which is with intimidate so runner has like this really interesting spot and um should always be a pretty reasonable hero in, in any meta i think like reiner is like this this really cool middle ground of flesh and blood so i do think it's well positioned in this meta just because of we're, what we're going to see early on either it can be really proactive and attack decks and make the most out of intimidate or uh, you know actually you've got the romping club and you can um, play you know most you're basically all your cards defend for three actually all your cards defend for three um except for some of the cards in monarch that you probably aren't putting in your deck or you're siding out uh, you have access to defense reactions um, that you can play easily and fit into your plan so you can you can tweak this deck either way it's a perfect example of a mid-range deck that can go either way i think <clears throat> which is what i really love about right now um you know you have obviously as brennan said the six attacks to break prism heralds things like that you have the boots you know to go in and, and gain actions to uh, really mm-hmm. punish the aura plan but i think levia actually does a better job into prism decks and probably is where i would look um early on if you know i was really expecting a meta of <clears throat> of aura based prism decks you know there's aura control kind of style decks um and that's because you have just natural <clears throat> sorry excuse me you have natural go again with your um with your with your attacks but then you also have the ability to go and gain action points with the boots um and you also have this you know really cool ability obviously to play cards out of your out of your banner zone and gain you know extra resources that way so <clears throat> i think that's where Livia can really excel, and for the same reason, into into ice decks as well. All right, Hayden, I can tell, I can tell you got a little hermit the frog in your throat. <laughs> I'll, so I'll, I'll take myself. over for you. And, yeah, no worry. So, um, totally agree with you on Livia and Reiner, by the way, and Livia specifically. And I think a lot of people will be interested will be kind of surprised to hear that. Um, but there's hope. There's hope, ladies and gentlemen. It uh, Livia might make a resurgence. So let's talk about let's talk about the last one here, which I think is a more vanilla one to be excited about. That's going to be Bravo. Bravo got some serious upgrades in Tales of Aria. We're talking about Terra Sunder. We're talking about Rampart of the Ramp's Head. Looks fantastic. Um, I'm lo- I really love the look of Bravo right now for so many reasons. Um, it 
it definitely looks like it's going to be tier one, one way or another. The only thing I'm worried about when playing that deck is Prism Aura. I think we're going to see a lot of Prism Aura early. Only thing I'm concerned about in Bravo. Um, but other than that, like Bravo is definitely you know very top of my list, very tier one. Um, I think it got some great upgrades in Tales of Aria, and things only got better, right? Yeah, I think this is one where there's already really strong established lists out there from the previous meta. They're going to come over into the Tales of Aria meta and just naturally do well. Um, but then you add on top of that, like you say, the upgrades, right? Like some really cool really cool cards. Uh, the fact that Bravo has um, this ability to easily adapt into different uh, metas, I think. And now, especially if even if Dash is the meta, you have uh, you have the Rampart, right? So you have in that another tool. So yeah, I mean, there's some really cool stuff. I mean, Forge for War maybe becomes, a, I know a lot of people talk about Forge for War because of Rampart. Um, I think it might be a bit cute, but there's a lot of things that Bravo can do, which I'm excited about. All right. So that, that kind of concludes our list of heroes that we think, you know, look to do very, very well um, in the meta. So let's talk about, you know, some contenders. You know, the rest are going to be contenders, but, you know, might struggle a little bit. I'm going to start off here with, I think, Katsu. Katsu for me is like, uh, uh, it's one of my favorite decks of all time. Uh, one of my favorite heroes. So personally, and this is obviously personal because you've heard Hayden himself disagree with me, is that I don't think that like the the Katsu control, as it was called, or kind of like Katsu midrange that like didn't really have a game plan will be successful. Obviously, it's it's very punishing to decks who don't know what they're doing. Um, but I don't know. The format is speeding up so much. Thing we've, we're so explosive these days, or we have the potential being so explosive. So with like, even if the format slows down, which I think I said speed up, I meant slow down. Um, you still have these five card hand kind of pivot turns that happen multiple times throughout a game that are just so far and above beyond like a twelve damage threshold or something like that, and on hit triggers, all this good stuff. Um, so I, I'm not really looking at Katsu Control, I'm more looking at Katsu Aggro, which was for me like the second best aggro deck in all of Monarch. And you know, say say we move chain out, um, yeah, Kats, Katsu Agro is really there. Or even Katsu mid range. I know we say Katsu Agro, but that looks what that looks like in, in its differentiation from mid range is quite murky. Um, I think that you know, from the traditional kind of labeling, I would probably be more on the mid range side. Looks really good. I mean, on hit triggers is always very punishing, especially in, a, in an early meta. And Katsu's like Dorinthian in the sense is just punishing um, kind of fundamentally if your opponent doesn't know how to block against you. So I think it looks really good. The, the one reason why I'm concerned for Katsu is ice. Like how does how does Katsu mid range or Katsu aggro deal with having its resources taxed or having um, you know its go again taxed or kind of all of this stuff. So I think that, that may have been net worse for Katsu mid range, but overall very strong deck and kind of has remained a strong deck literally since its inception. And Welcome to Wraith, in my opinion. Mm. Yeah, you could get pretty well stomped by Blizzard as a card, right? Um, yeah, it's a pretty pretty impactful card against you. I think there's a real sliding scale to Katsu. All the way from like hyper aggressive, really low to the ground builds to you know fairly aggressive to mid range and to these like mid range control to you know like pretty hard control decks. It is really a sliding scale. I think there's no like some people would call one list mid range, some would call it aggressive, some would call it <laughs> control even. So there's it's not really clear in terms of the delineation between those three sort of styles of deck. But one thing I would say about Katsu is like okay, it's going to depend on um, I think how many defensive decks show up as to which sort of Katsu people play or how many uh, control decks show up. Like that's that's probably going to define it. How good Flick Flack is, I think is really going to define how good Katsu is. Um, and how good on hit effects are is also probably going to define how good Katsu is. And then once you weigh up all those things, then you've got to worry about ice, right? You've got to worry about the Frostbites to Brennan's point. So I think there's a lot of things that are going to go into whether Katsu can find success in this format. Whereas in the previous one, it felt like while well, Katsu had a number of ways to probably attack the format as we went through the the meta, as the meta developed, um, whereas now I think it might be a little bit more of a case of, okay, what does the meta start to look like? Is Katsu going to be viable? But in saying that, you know, week one, uh, slinging a Katsu aggro deck probably isn't the worst thing, has a really proactive game plan, has mask momentum, has access to flick flack out of your sideboard if you want to, you know, have that plan available to you. So um, yeah, could be could could be a contender for sure. For sure. Next, I want to talk about Dorinthia, another ode back to the original four heroes. So Dorinthia, um, I think it's just a really strong hero in the early meta. Uh, that being said, the most prominent deck is, in my opinion, the worst deck to face is Dorinthia, um, which is Prism. So Prism does seem really rough for Dorinthia. I think you have to kind of heavily tech the deck to have a, a better matchup versus Prism. So that's why I'm looking away. But I actually think that you know Dorinthia really struggled into Chain. It struggles into Husk and you know just the relentless pressure the Chain was able to put out. There was a Dorinthia build 
that was a lot stronger than what was you know kind of popular among most Dorentheus as I saw. Uh, that was mostly playing like Dangerous Pass Pilgrim and things like this. Um, that build does struggle into you know Bravo and defense reaction decks, but it was actually quite a bit better in the chain. I was worried about it going into the calling. Anyway, Dorinthia, very strong. Um, you know, has potential to be extremely powerful. Just how can you shore up that prism matchup? Because I think again, that's the number one question as you head into the meta. Yeah, I mean Dorinthia is always solid. It punishes people who don't defend well into it or don't understand how the deck wants to play out. Uh, it can you know have some of the best second cycles in the game. Um, with cards, you know, with some really great yellow cards that are compared for late game and blue cards across like, you know, Singing Steel Blade, uh, Iron Song Termination, Glint the Quicksilver, um, Twinning Blade, you know, there's so many things that it can do late in the game and has so many threats, you know, has really good threat density with the weapon and um, and it's not attack action. So, yeah, I think Dorinthia is like always, always a good solid choice. Your hands always do something because of your mix of attack reactions um, and non-attack actions and just the fact that the weapon is your game plan, right? So it's always on. Uh, so yeah, yeah I, I just think, like you say, Prism is tough, but the fact that you don't have to tech so heavily for Chain anymore with Dorinthia probably means that um, you can play it into a, a more wide open field and find success, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, Hayden, oh, yeah, I want to hear, because you, you played it on stream against me. Tell me about uh, Lexi in this, this yeah. upcoming format. Yeah, I think, you know, you'll notice when we talked about, I guess, the heroes that we think could define the meta or have immediate success, we didn't talk about any of the, the new Tales of Aria heroes. And that's not because we don't think that these heroes are going to, you know, be good and immediately impact the format. I think it's more of a case of we just don't know right now. Um, they're the, the first kind of takeaway is these, these decks, these heroes are very difficult to build. The requirement of the element cards um, into your builds make it you know not easy to build the fact that it's not really clear which direction you should go uh, is also difficult i will say though that i think lexi has uh, probably the the highest immediate potential of the three to become an immediate contender i think and um, that's really down to the fact that you have this like ability to build really proactive game plans that can also disrupt whether that be with ice or whether that be just like straight out damage with um, with lightning so i think lexi does have uh, immediate potential the one thing that could you know i guess there's a bit of a knock against lexi is that we haven't seen decks without a um without an attacking weapon do well in flesh and blood class constructed so far so you know like wizard um like azalea um these heroes have uh, you know struggled a little bit prism would be the one that kind of breaks that mold i guess from the previous format but if we look back at prism didn't do well early in the format yes it won the calling and, and a fantastic job and at the calling you know day two conversion rate but that is also a little bit different in the fact that it turns its cards into weapons. Um, and it, I think, you know, we saw the aura build that does that very well, uh, be successful. So yeah, I'm, I have a bit of some, some hesitancy around saying that Lexi is just going to immediately be, you know, a really strong tier one deck, but there's some really powerful interactions and some really powerful things that Lexi can do. So yeah, I'm excited to, to, um, see where she goes. Yeah. And following what Hayden said, we're probably going to have to put Briar and old him kind of in the same bucket where, Honestly, just not enough testing is done, and, and the decks, even if there are decks out there, or even if we have created decks, are nowhere near tuned, where if we kind of pull decks straight out of Monarch that had you know no potential upgrades or downgrades in Tales of Aria, they could just get vanilla transfer over from Monarch. Uh, those are going to be a lot more optimized just in general, so hard to say at the moment. Um, but I do think Briar looks really cool. How it you know is more powerful or potentially more powerful than this ride, we will see. Old him is something that a lot of people will be going to. But again, you have its counterpart, Bravo, which you have to have a reason to play that. Um, I think old him, you know, kind of ice or control is very interesting for a lot of people, and we will see a lot of it. Um, but its impact is kind of hard for us to predict at this point. But so we're gonna go ahead and toss it in this section. But hey, no one ask you a question. And this is a question I know on you know, some right on the tip of some some listeners' tongues, and that's is Azalea. So Azalea, is Azalea still at that uh is it still the worst hero in Flesh and Blood? Is it still unplayable as some people would so boldly say? It, you know, where do you see Azalea? Well, at I least at a cursory glance. I need to go back for a second. Sorry to 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 leave everyone with bated breath about uh Azalea, but I need to, to I just want to say a few things about Briar and Time as well because there is you know i don't want to just completely gloss over these heroes about what they could be or what they could do in this format so one thing i do want to say about lexi for instance with the new heroes is i think a lightning build in week one is probably a very good place to start now uh, we featured a lightning build on on camera this week um that you can go and check out actually versus our levier list uh if we talk about old time um you know i think if you are looking to build old time initially you want to take advantage of the ability to create these frostbite tokens to uh come in with cards like maybe 
book and old or uh, endless winter to really put pressure on the opponent um, and really disrupt their game plan uh, probably coupling with like crush effects i think that's a really good place to start with all time if you look at briar uh rosetta thorn is so 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 annoying and you know can be really difficult for decks to deal with if you can keep up constant pressure and uh briar can keep up constant pressure there is you know so many good ways to do that and you know even if you can't keep up constant pressure you can put in damage and get uh, embodiment of earth tokens so a lot of things that briar can do as well so i just want to before we got into zalia i just want to say i think there's some some sort of clearer game plans to go for week one uh with those decks and we'll see where they go from there you know whether that be like earth builds uh versus uh ice builds with all time or a, a mix or whether it be uh briar you know with these like really aggressive like lightning focus builds with a bit of earth in there or, or what that looks like but azalea all right <laughs> I mean, Azalea has always been playable, right? I think, you know, Azalea obviously gets dunked on. Brennan likes to dunk on Azalea. Uh, what? <laughs> <laughs> no, I do not. All right. Yeah, Azalea, Brennan. So I think obviously it gets better. You know, you get Seek and Destroy. Uh, you get the access to Honing Hood if that's the, the equipment that you think you should play in that hero. I'm not actually certain that that's 100% true. Um, it just probably becomes whether, like, the format becomes conducive to a really sort of aggressive linear build uh, or whether there's some some more sort of cute things you can do with Azalea. Overflex probably is a card that's pretty reasonable in Azalea. Um, Seek and Destroy, very good. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. Seek and Destroy, which I kind of led with, I think is probably the card that, that gives a lot to Azalea. At the very least, replaces Nimbleism if people are playing that card. So, look, I think Azalea is probably still going to be one of the lower tier decks in the format. Um, I think it's for me it's in the probably the the top of these heroes that, that could do well but to be honest it's probably in the the group of heroes that are still going to struggle i think and and um lexi's probably going to have more immediate impact um but we'll, we'll see what happens yeah i'm gonna hold my breath on that one i think that it has a chance yeah. azalea two arsenals i think azalea like azalea um, specialization cards are super super strong which uh kind of has me you know hoping then wondering or living on a dream that it has a, a potential in this next format so we will see um i think that like last format from a theory base which is what's funny i won't go too much in this but from a theory base azalea actually kind of attacked chain quite well but obviously azalea theory has always kind of fallen short mm -hmm. um so we'll see maybe they maybe azalea was never meant to have two arsenals and they kind of changed it to that you know, after they saw its performance and then that could crack up on a whole new thing for us. But yeah, yeah super excited to see Azalea. But Hayden, tell me about, well, get me started. And obviously we can start with the, you know, the chain boy on uh, what decks we think will struggle in this new meta. Yeah, we do want to touch on on every hero. Uh, these are the we've talked through the heroes that we think you know have have potential or we think are going to be very good. You know, from sort of day dot. Um, but there is a group of heroes that we think probably are going to struggle or they're going to need to. They got a bit of an uphill battle if they want to uh, do well in this format. Chain's a good place to start. Now, obviously, the Seeds of Agony ban is massive for Chain. I'm probably a bit more pessimistic, uh, sorry, optimistic than you are, Brendan, about, about, I guess, Chain's chances if I was a Chain player, which I'm not. Uh, I'm just a, a player who wants to play the best deck in the Same. format. <laughs> I don't care. I'm actually perfectly happy that Chain's gone. I'm so excited to explore other areas of um, deck building and uh, other heroes. But, you know, if I'm looking at Chain and thinking, okay, like, what does Chain do now? I think you, know, you still have a pretty proactive game plan. Uh, you still have some really powerful cards. You still have uh, a hero ability that says go again on go it. Go again yeah. on the, yeah. <laughs> exactly, it's printed on the hero. So, like, Chain is still inherently a powerful hero. It just lost its its card that enabled the early game, the mid game, the late game. Um, so you need to come up with a different way to attack the format. And that what that looks like, that might look like a, a more mid-rangey or a bit of a slower deck. Um, might or look more like high a, roll. Yeah, yeah. Or, or maybe, yeah, you're just, like, you're just playing Tremors and you're playing, you're just playing, like, a red line aggressive deck with some good cards that can be played at a banish but you know seeds enabled a lot of those plans so um we'll have to we'll have to see i don't to be honest i don't have like a starting point if i was to rebuild chain right now i'm not super interested in i think like a if i'm looking at rune blade i'm a lot more interested in viscerai right now and uh and briar but at some point i think i'll probably jump on a, a chain list and see what we come up with dimensional gateway is a card that probably uh does come up to me immediately and says that card might need to be in the deck somewhere so we'll gateway or crossroads gateway yeah, the the, okay. the rear, not the not the majestic. <laughs> okay. Crossroads is interesting too. We'll see if that ever sees us today. They always play that. We played that card actually a lot in Monarch Meta <laughs> to did, initially yeah, yeah. Yeah. punish fatigue. Um, but it's high variance. So let's go. Yeah. So I love that I get to introduce this guy. So Kano. Yeah. Everything since Crucible of War has been terrible for Kano. Like absolutely abysmal. Almost worse than anything preceding it. So Prism 
and Chain were both extremely bad for Kano. Um, Spellvoy is really bad, and then Prism with the Ordos is just, oh god, it's so bad. Um, and then now we have Ice. Ice is pretty bad for Kano as well. Can he deal with Ice? Like, is Kano still going to be a Blitz deck? Yes, it will. Um, I think. Ice just forces you to really play on your opponent's turn, which blows. I know there's a lot of Kanos out there that love playing on their opponent, opponent's mm. turn all the time and going off the top. I hate doing that. I like doing that to win, but only when I know the information of that deck. But now... Um, it does seem like the kind of chip in, chip in, chip in, set up a stir forked is like not as good. At least in the ice, it's going to be really, really tricky. So we'll see. Um, I do think that Kano has just been progressively put into a harder position since Crucible of War. Yeah. Um, and I would actually probably put it under, I mean, it, it gets pretty freaking close. Like it depends on what the meta looks like, in my opinion. And I'm a Kano advocate, but I put it close to being under Azalea as we come into this minute is it's like super prism dominated and Azalea now has like new horizons. seek can destroy all these other tools. Um, yeah, I just, I don't see with Kano. I hope I'm proved wrong because I would love to play that deck. Yeah, I think I agree. I think it is under Azalea personally. Um, and yeah, I mean, it just, you just, the, the, the way to play Kano just keeps getting narrowed and narrowed and, um, it takes away the strength of that deck, which, you know, you start at 30 life. That's a big consideration. So, you know, I want to talk about dash next. Dash was a hero that had pretty reasonable success in the previous Roads Nationals format in the lead up to Vegas. Um, we really saw it come on from sort of like week three and four. Uh, and we definitely, you know, we saw it do reasonably well in Vegas as well. Uh, a top eight berth for Dash there as well. Um, the card that, you know, I think really might change Dash is going to be Rampart, right? So Guardian, you know, presumably, and what people would say is one of the worst matchups for Guardian has always been Dash, right? Uh, just there's too hard to deal with the the pistol uh, you need to be like super aggressive to beat it but you can't enact this like more mid-range or slower game plan against it but now you have access to rampart uh, that could really change that you know pistol breaks the chain every time you need to put a counter on it so as soon as you block the second time ramparts uh, can have two counters uh, two two plus one stacks on it uh, and then you can just block with that you know even if there's pleasant purifier so dash is probably still gonna need to be lo looking to be very aggressive as a deck, which it, it kind of was in the last format anyway. Uh, that's more what we saw. The top eight deck we saw from Alberta was a bit more sort of classic, but um, what we probably saw from like the like the Matt Rogers sort of deck lists and some of the lists that we saw towards like weeks four and five of the meta were a bit more aggressive in nature. So I think that's probably where we where we land and probably what we'll see from Dash, but it'll be interesting to see how it goes now with one of its best matchups probably being potentially one of its worst matchups um, and you know a different format coming in. Yeah, totally agree with you. We'll have to see if, um, I mean, Rampart, I haven't tested it, um, to be totally honest. So I think that it is somewhat still theory at this point, even if it's dunking on the current uh, iterations of Dash. It's still, you know, we have to give Dash time to try to, you know, kind of rebuild the deck or reevaluate, switch up the strategy, and maybe um, it can beat out the theory. But it does look bad. It is definitely not good at all for Dash in terms yeah. of that. It probably being a popular deck and Rampart existing. Yeah, we might be a little bit low on a dash here, actually. It's probably yeah, still going to so. do pretty pretty well, to be honest. And, and like, you still have access to high octane and just, like, really aggressive boost strategy plans. So I don't think dash is going anywhere. Um, it's just that, you know, a deck that like Bravo that's probably going to grow in popularity and was one of your best matchups now becomes potentially uh, one of your more difficult matchups. But the deck look, could look just like this aggro deck and, and dash could do still very, very well. So we'll, we'll wait and see. <laughs> in which it might struggle against ice yeah so this is like always exactly. like this you know, tic-tac-toe here so now on to every you know everybody was holding their breath this one so we're talking about bolton so i'll go ahead and talk about saber bolton first so saber bolton um i think it's dead i think it's probably dead um i didn't show up to the funeral at least and the deck you know it already folded in the face of any sort of disruption or sorry minimal disruption at that so command and conquer was popular card in the format i mean that deck really struggled when Command and Conquer was drawn in multiples or played against it on key turns. Um, now we have an entire an entire talent devoted to doing stuff like that, whether it's destroying your armor, which is key, whether it's stopping you from Gogan, which is key. So many things um, that you know. I hope that that should be enough for No Saber Bolton. People, yeah. So I don't think it's going to be there because just so much disruption. It's just like Command and Conquer on steroids now um, with a lot of other cards. And a lot of which just can totally hose uh, Bolton, especially like, you know, like expose the elements in the right scenario it can just be devastating. But obviously you got to draw it. And sometimes they just draw the Natty, you know, turn four, uh, triple Lumina, all that good stuff. So it'll still be, it'll be still there to get the wins that, you know, it draws into. 
Uh, yeah, I don't think I, I don't personally think Sailor Bolton is uh, is dead, as you put it. it is, we it's blasphemy. <laughs> but look, I think I think that's a like it's a fun deck. It has like this really proactive game plan. It's really hard to deck. well, it's reasonably hard to interact with. But when you do interact with it, it's uh, it can really set it back and, and as you say, be devastating. But I think this is a, a strategy that we'll still see because um, you know it's just one you can pick up and just kind of just jam into mm-hmm. opponents, right? Uh, in terms of like the Raiden builds, which were probably still they were more popular uh, in the lead up to Vegas. Maybe Vegas um, Bolton ended up being the Saber Bolton ended up being more prevalent. I think that's the one that's you know it's going to be interesting. So you don't really need resources to attack with that deck, right? Because Raiden costs zero. You can play these zero cost charge cards. But if you're being hit with Frostbites, for instance, like that really does start to change the dynamic of probably how you have to build that deck, uh, where you probably want to play off a, a resource card every turn. So I'd be interested to see like what that means for Bolton. Um, to be honest, I'm really not sure how Bolton's going to play into this point. My, my initial take is it's going to struggle. There's aggressive decks that do better jobs with on-hit effects uh, that are more prevalent. Uh, you've got Lexi now with like lightning builds. Frostbite and ice builds seem to be uh, probably a problem for, for these Bolton um, Raiden builds. And as we see things be even more mid-rangey, traditionally Bolton feels like it's going to struggle into these mid-range decks. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll we'll see. We'll see what happens. Uh, it could still still be very good. I think Raiden is is a very good weapon, um, and that hero ability is very strong. So could be could be very wrong, but we'll see. Agreed. Like uh, even for Raiden, a lot of the disruption doesn't really bode too well. So it's it's just a very it historically it's kind of a card hungry class resource hungry class and especially if you're having things that attack for zero and you tack a resource onto that i mean one versus zero is infinitely more expensive than zero um so it's really tough to deal with cool all right brilliant. rounds it out we want to talk a little bit about how to find some early success in this new meta um and just really just rattle off a few things that we think are going to be important if you're thinking about you know week one week two week three heading to a tales of Aria classic instructor format what are some of the things that i think should be or we think should be on your mind and uh things that you should definitely be thinking about so first of all is having a game plan versus controlling ice decks uh it's the new toy people are going to want to play these ice decks that they build up whether that be like lexi kind of death and tax style decks whether that be uh all time quite defensive decks um you know these are the sort of things that you're going to need to make sure you have a bit of a plan against because they are going to show up people are going to play these anything to say about that brennan yeah i mean i totally agree um just keep it like with especially the new heroes if you're looking to win like early in the meta like i think that a lot of the very competitive events such as the callings they don't really or the pro quest which is more important doesn't really come until um quite a bit a few weeks uh and we do actually have some like kind of bit like big constructed events happen before that which will get a lot of fun but keep in mind like the new heroes and what the what they can do um because it's a new format people are here to have fun um and people you know will bring those decks and compete with them and that's some knowledge that you will have not had before if you don't have time to test to it you can't really prepare for it too well so you kind of have to take it from a theory perspective and just be like you know where do i expect this deck to kind of land when it's uh when somebody else is piling it Mm -hmm, definitely next would be uh you know if you want to find success early on just have a proactive game plan um or or just have a proactive deck in general you know be proactive or at least have ability to have a proactive game plan it's a great way to attack the meta uh week one people's uh, you know builds are going to be untuned there's going to be a lot of like differentiation and how people build heroes so when they flip them up you don't even necessarily know what they're going to play so trying to react to what they're doing is going to be very difficult so just having a proactive game plan is often a very good way to find success you know week one of a meta yep and uh yeah, you definitely have to be prepared for fatigue as well. Um, fatigue will be there in the early weeks. If it will stay, that is something that you know will become readily apparent and you can attack for it more and more. But it may be having an extra remembrance or kind of keeping in mind what you're pitching when you're playing against these decks, setting up big five-card hands um, will be important. Uh, I don't think it will be extremely prevalent, like it will be dominant by any means, but keep it in mind because if you are playing against a fatigue strategy and you sort of don't take that into account as you play throughout your 40 minutes of game, um yeah you can't just straight up lose the game but if you you know if you're able to recognize that strategy you can do a lot throughout the early and mid game to help you finish out in that late game mm-hmm. yep um all right last question brennan you uh you're on your way to there's a surprise pro quest this weekend it's classic constructed you are on your way you've got you got to decide your deck uh before you know today probably before you go what uh what's your number one pick what's the deck you're taking and then give me Chamber you know Bolton. two other two other options that you would also consider <laughs> Uh, i just got my my two little sores i'm just gonna combo now um for me it's 
going to be Reinar, Viserai, and Bravo. I think the forefront of that might actually be Reinar. Weirdly enough, we saw Reinar struggle a little bit in Monarch meta, but I just really love how it's positioned against Levia. Uh, not Levia, sorry, <laughs> Prism. And I really like how it's positioned against like uh, Control decks, Fatigue decks, or Totally decks with the Evasion off of Intimidate and things like Barrage and Beatdown. Um, so right now, Reinar is at the forefront of my mind, but I think when I tell when I say Reinar, I am speaking from a theory perspective. Could turn out that, you know, kind of in reality, like it's just not good enough. It's just not fast enough. Um, you know, so many different things. So time will tell, but then closely behind that is both Viscerai and Bravo. I think Bravo might be the, uh, the most disciplined pick. I would just have to figure out a way since the progress is very soon, like you say, to, to kind of shore up that, that Prism Aura matchup. Yeah. Yeah, no, fair enough. Uh, I would I would take Olivia if if I had to just just go this weekend and, and take a deck. Uh, we have a list that you know it doesn't change from the last meta that I think had good matchups into that meta, uh, but ultimately struggled into probably what was a chain dominator meta. Uh, so I would just pick up the Olivia, have the you know have the plan already for it. But other other considerations, I think Reiner definitely a consideration. Viserai, I'm like super excited about that um, that deck in general, but. If I was just, just if someone asked me like what should I take this weekend, there's lists already out there and available. Um, I would definitely say like Rhyna, um, Bravo, Lightning Lexi, and even I wouldn't be above suggesting Don't just, say it. <laughs> just playing Katsu Control. <laughs> <laughs> All right, then my little caveat suggestion to the person who asked me, I'm gonna tell them and just even Saber Bolton, just so we can both be contrarian. Sure, over here. sure. Sounds good to me. <laughs> All right, Brennan. Well, that wraps up uh, our first sort of thoughts on the classic constructed meta with Tales of Aria and what we think might see success early on uh, and what decks maybe, you know, might need a bit of a helping hand or someone to really come through and uh, improve some of these uh, these builds. Awesome. And we do have something very exciting as we end here. And <laughs> in order to break up the monotony, that is the outro. And Hayden isn't ready for this. Oh, you already hear him. <laughs> so we do have a YouTube page, Arsenal Pass. We do post deck text, gameplay. Um, of course, all these podcasts here, uh, you know, you hear here, as well as our other podcast called Arsenal Pass Time of the Round, which is much more free form. And we usually have a guest on there as well. So if you're interested, go check us out on YouTube and choose a subscription. Speaking, speaking of subscriptions, there are almost at 2,000 subscribers. I remember there was a little promise that someone made to me before we hit 1,000. Um, his, his name rhymes with Yaden Male. And I have to ask you, Hayden, what color, if you were going to go yellow for 1,000, what color are you going for 2,000? I'd like to point out I've never made any promises. I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'd be the perfect politician, but don't worry. I'm, I'm uh, looking to, to, you know, make sure we, we celebrate our, our, our milestones in, uh, in some way, shape, and form. Yep, we're gonna have to go ice blue to uh, get ready for the new form. <laughs> ready for the new form. Anyway, um, so Hayden and I are both on Twitter. I am located at the Fitty Shades, um, kind of like that really popular novel that came out recently. And Hayden is at uh, at underscore f y e n, sorry at f y e n underscore Dale Fiendale, kind of like Toma Fiendal. Check us out. Um, we are pretty new to Twitter, but we do really like engaging with everybody else on there, and we've had a really good time. Obviously, big shout out to our Patreon, over hundred page different patrons so far it's helped us so much um we do have the special patron pod coming out this week in the interactive session all that good stuff and there's sure to be a lot more deck techs to come with full cyborg guides ratios math all that good stuff you know pick it up be competitive you know the big the big you know the whole shebang for <laughs> to sell it but thank you so much again for all the patrons um anyway thank you everybody so much for listening that concludes episode 25 of arsenal pass and we will see you next week see you later